Thank you so much for joining this growth support conversation where we facilitate growth for customer support professionals, teams, and functions. I'm your host, Neil, and today we're talking about managing your tech stack, choosing the best tools that work for you, how to optimize them, avoiding tech debt early, managing your vendors. And in order to talk about this, I'm joined by Matt Barron, the Invigate product specialist and host of Ticket Volume Podcasts, news and information for improving IT experiences, Ticket Volume connects community of service management professionals with new ideas and perspectives. He's worked in technology his whole career and is a huge IT fan and overall amazing person who actually inspired me to get started with Growth Support. So I'm super excited to have you here. It's my honor. Thanks for starting it. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I'm, I'm really curious. How'd you get into technology and service management in the first place? I'm very lucky and entitled to have been born at the time that technology was starting to make waves. Uh, so it was really easy for me to catch that first wave. Uh, basically, my first year of college, they needed these lab monitors to watch computer labs because they used to have rooms of shared computers because not all students uh, came with that. a computer. <laughs> okay, excellent, good. All right, I'm not feeling so dated. That's perfect. <laughs> uh, and so I would staff and I was uh, just standing, I was sitting in the computer lab waiting for things to break or for people to have problems and um, got pretty bored doing it, so started to just clean the lab and fix the computers. And fairly quickly, the IT department said, we, we need to have you on staff. We need you on our service desk, taking calls. Um, can you help us build our ticketing system in FileMaker? And so that's kind of where it all started. And I never looked back and kind of just continued to apply those same principles at every job since then. I always find it really funny. I think we've, we've said it on the show before as well. It's like it's always funny how people fall fall into support from different directions and areas. But IT is very parallel to customer support because the customers you serve might be internal or different than the actual external customers that you serve. What do you think are the big differences between service management and IT versus like the standard or like classic customer support that you see normally? Oh my gosh, what a great question and something that I think about constantly. So often in customer service, you're you're basically partnering with product management. You're, you know, you're usually supporting a specific application or a specific function or a specific company. And so that partnership is really, really important. What you learn doing customer service, the product team wants to know, and what product is working on is the future of support. In IT, it's very similar, except for a lot of the products are not our own. Uh, so you end up having to partner kind of with um, other ways of thinking about IT operations and how to keep IT up, available, and an enjoyable experience and so it's a unique challenge because you don't have a lot of ownership over the products you don't you don't have people like in product management that are curious about how they can help you better and maybe not even have the same goals <laughs> yeah you also get to avoid all those pesky feature requests right <laughs> hmm. well not really because people will say you know they'll say things like um we're using Miro, for example, and they're like, oh, I really like Mural instead or Figma instead. And so then you do get these feature requests or like uh, on the sales teams, a lot of times they want new gadgets so that when they're out in the field, they're impressing customers like I need the latest and greatest Mac. So you do get these these requests to, to innovate past what you're already delivering for service, which keeps good IT departments on their toes. Nice. And and yeah, with all of that comes a lot of tools that are available. You have people recommending like a lot of technical solutions that from their side, what they need, how do you kind of cut through the noise and choose the ones that are going to be you know, specific for your needs? I, I tend to, when I give advice on this specifically to IT departments, oftentimes we talk about using design thinking, going to the customers, doing the research to understand and truly listen to their needs it, it it takes a special person to have the empathy to listen to that to to, to conduct the research and to to really come back with you know an understanding of what the organization needs to be successful and historically it has been known as a, a bottleneck to innovation 
But thankfully, I think a lot of this is starting to turn around over the last uh, five years or so post pandemic where people realize that, you know, if the, for example, during the pandemic, a lot of people had to move from working into offices to working from home. Well, IT had to do that lift and shift. You know, we saw IT departments going from, you know, 10,000 desktop computers in an office location to 10,000 laptops in everyone's locations. And so I think it's just a testimony and a proof that IT, given the right budget, given the right business needs, can can do a lot really fast. And uh, what we're seeing now is a lot of the fallout from that. How do we how do we do that in a scalable way, in a repeatable way, and um, and think about you know the new way of working and and delivering great service? It's a it's the new challenge. Indeed, and and right now with so many new tools coming out and being available, if you think about it in terms of the tooling that you use for your support teams and how you serve your customers, there's so many shiny object tools that are like, hey, this could be really, really cool to be able to add this functionality or feature. Hey, this could be really cool. Uh, and really deciding what is going to be the best goes a long way towards that research and getting what you need from your customers. There's so many like, hey, we have possibilities. We can do this with it. We can do this with it. We can do this with it. Uh, and I think people can be very over eager to start implementing tools and implementing tools and just kind of like adding the, the pebbles to the plate a little bit. How do you really be not strict, but really define the needs that you that you want to have as an organization? The, the you, when you're talking about tools that work for you, that plural, uh, element is so important. Having the people that use the tools and benefit from the tools, all those stakeholders that are involved in tooling, involved in the process of selection, not only does it help remove bias, um, because of course we're all biased, we can't help that, it's inherent in human nature, but it also gives people ownership and, and responsibility over that tool. So we talk about org change a lot, right? Like you're switching out ticketing tools. You have to get people on board. Are they gonna adopt and adapt to this new technology? Well, if they're part of that transition, not only do they, do they believe already, they're already on board because it was their idea. So it helps them stay focused on why they're doing what they're doing. And then when it comes time to switch out, then they, they can actually support that vision for the future. And so part of that can be just asking them, but I think a large part of it more often than not should be a focus on process uh, where I don't know how much this exists in the customer service space, but we are OCD about our processes in IT. And that's how you keep some of these complex systems and technology working is by just having a, a defined process and always sticking to it. And so typically I'll see teams that want to want to switch to a new solution. You know, maybe they're switching out their ERP. Maybe you're switching out from Microsoft to Google for collaboration. I encourage teams to build the processes, understand what that workflow actually is like in the tool. And then um, that way you understand how they, what, where the gaps and opportunities are and to make sure that that next tooling is gonna fill what already exists and then take it to the next step. The, the last bit of advice that I always give people is to do proof of concepts. Don't just take a vendor's word for it get it in place, uh, especially if they've got trials. And if they don't, a lot of vendors, especially the ones that really want to be true partners of yours, they will go that extra effort. They will go the extra mile with you to prove that they can provide that value to you, you know, before you even start paying, before you even have a license, before, hopefully before ink is on paper, because that way you can choose, you know, based off of facts as opposed to sales and marketing promises. Yeah, and there's also a lot of tools now that allow you to get those kind of trials through a third-party service or something as well. They can also really help you to do that selection. And I really like what you said about, you know, you have your process in place, kind of really map those out and really get those started. And look at the capabilities of your current tooling. What can it do? What is it going to suit your needs? 
when I was uh, the support ops lead here at AIHR, I actually was the one who did the selection process and everything for our current help desk. And we had HubSpot in place, for example, and they have a service desk included in the product and, and an option there for, hey, you can run your entire conversations and ticketing through HubSpot. And I was going through all the needs and capabilities and everything, and I was like, oh, well, you know, maybe we want to do a different tool outside of the, our, our primary CRM, for example, which can give us a little bit more. Uh, and it suited us better. Uh, and so far, it's been going, going very well uh, So that the past two years. But looking at that, I'm curious to know when you're, and from your perspective, what, when do you like double down on an existing tool or just use existing capabilities versus when do you determine, hey, actually we need, even though it's included in this existing tool, we might need something else to partner with it instead of just using what we have. Mm, yeah, yeah. Um, there is a term for this in IT. We call it application rationalization. Just understanding, you know, are you are you overpaying? You know, you don't you don't want to be driving a Maserati if you're just going to the grocery store and back every day. Um, and likewise, if you're entered into a Formula One race, you don't want to be driving a Honda Civic. So you need you need fit for purpose tooling. And I think the best vendors, the best technology vendors truly partner with their customers. Um, they'll they'll invest in customer success. They will they will say no to clients that don't fit their value proposition. So it kind of comes down to, you know, measuring your ROI. So focus on the metrics of your tooling. You know, is is this how much does this cost? For example, you know, what we know how much each ticket costs. Now, how much of that ticket cost is the tool itself? What does that actually look like? And then, you know, if you look at the percentage of tickets that that leverage, say, an AI feature, for example, you know, you can determine if those features are actually fitting your needs or not, and actually take a a um, objective approach to understanding does this actually fit our needs for the for the cost point. But typically, I think people realize uh, fairly early on, and teams will realize fairly early on if it's too big for them, too small for them, too expensive for them, or just not a good fit at all. Similar to uh, I just had Firefox crash on me, and it, you know I should be using Chrome because we're using a Google Hangout. So it's sort of like we used to have this problem where technologists were rare, and we didn't understand technology very well. We have moved on. We have evolved. <laughs> you know, if if Twitter or X isn't serving our needs, people move to Instagram and Threads and Blue Sky and Pebble and all the other options, and so. I think it really is just staying in touch with the people that are using it and staying in touch with the people that are leveraging it and getting value out of it because then you know you can you can start to get a feel a sense for when things need to change. What what do you think? I would love to hear what you think. <laughs> I think really understanding one the needs of the business like what do you actually need it to do uh, in terms of how far can you take it? Because when you think about tooling and you think about implementing these changes, you don't want to lock yourself in permanently to, hey, we've embedded this one tool so deeply that we can't move away from it now. So now we're really, really stuck with a solution that might not age very well um, in terms of the scalability of our business. So mm -hmm. maybe you want something to be a little bit more flexible to avoid some early tech debt or like tech debt later on. How how far can you take it? I think one of the things that's said in support a lot is we're always asked to do le more with less, and we really need to streamline the kind of costs that we spend. I really like what you say. You know, you know how much your cost per ticket is, how much of that is tooling, and how far can you go in reducing that while also keeping the agent experience and the customer experience at a very high level. Uh, to make sure that you are keeping your standards high. And a part of that is optimizing the tools as much as you can. I think there's a lot of times when we've gone like, hey, yeah, we implemented this tool. Uh, 
we know that this is going to be a trapdoor decision kind of moving forward, but this is why we really need it. Uh, and I think using a framework to determine, is it going to be adjustable later on? Uh, you know, what's that kind of trapdoor level look like to you? Uh, and how flexible can it be in the future will also be important. Yeah, yeah, some huge concepts in there. You know, when it comes to tech debt, it that is something that you're always trying to avoid. And I think, you know, I, I got the opportunity to study product management for a little while. And I think that you start to learn the beauty of simplicity and really great tooling gives you just enough rope to get you out of the water without enough rope to hang yourself. Uh, and so I usually tell, especially for larger tools like, like HubSpot, Salesforce, ERP systems, some of these larger systems, um, to think like product managers and understand where those guardrails should be, where, where are the boundaries of what we should and should not do and have the, have the discipline to say no. And that that's a really hard thing to do because we love to say yes, especially in our in our industry. We're in hospitality, we care for people, we're empathetic, so we want to say yes all the time. But so often, uh, no, it serves you in the long term. So I for for some of those concepts, I think it's really great to find find vendors that have a customer success team, but also it's great to have community. You know, we met on support driven and I see constantly people putting things out there. You know, we use HubSpot for whatever, or we use this CRM. Uh, what, what, do, what do people think about it? How, how many full-time staff members do you have dedicated to it? And it's sort of, it's understanding that total, total cost of ownership, TCO, is such a huge aspect of, of finding and building and selecting these, these large systems. And then the last bit of advice I usually try to give people is to think about switching costs. When you're, when you're putting in these systems, how easy is it to get the data out? How easy is it to integrate? Does it cost money to, to leverage an API? Can you actually uh, export out your entire data set? I use this term hostage as a service instead of software as a service. And it, you're trying to avoid that that hostage situation. You know, you don't want to be in a tool where you can never extract the value and say, okay, I'm done with this tool. Time to migrate to the next one. So it's sort of like planning ahead for the transition while still understanding the guardrails of where you need to be and then selecting tools that hopefully partner with your with your company and will will help you. I love that you say that because there are so many times I we when we originally implemented our first help desk for for our service we were coming from Gmail and from there it's like yeah there's literally you can't get anything out of it it's just yeah. the inbox yeah. so going from from like hey we have absolutely no reporting to hey now we actually have some reporting here's how we can start getting the information uh, and we start to build up a little bit of that flexibility because now we're not locked into hey there's no switch cost now because we can get all that information out uh and you can keep some historical information we originally also switched one of our billing systems way back in the day and we we're looking at it from a customer perspective of like okay well we move the billing systems we hire a new rep who only has access access to the new one uh but they need to go to the old one to understand some customer situation how do you transfer that knowledge of tooling throughout the teams as well after you switch? There's so many times when I've had to enable teams, oh yeah, actually you're in the wrong system uh, to look at this. <laughs> so how much of that switch cost and that transition do you hold on to after you've made the switch? Yeah, that's a great question. And I hate answering this one, but so often, and I, I, I did implementation, I've been doing service management implementations for the last uh, 12 years or so. And so often people want to hang on to their ticket data. They want to hang on to the ticket history. I want to report on them. But really, and really, hopefully, you're switching tooling for a reason. 
and, and usually it's either process driven or company growth driven or scale driven. And so oftentimes I find that that historical data isn't as useful in your new reality. Now, sale, sales and CRMs are kind of a unique beast because you're not going to throw away customer data ever, <laughs> really. Uh, but when it comes to ticketing, uh, I think it's great to start fresh. It's it's great to, to have a reset, to have a data reset and a mental reset and a KPI reset. And part of part of that could be a benefit, a way for you to sell it to agents like, look, your CSAT score just got reset back. You are on a clean blank slate right now. Impress every customer. You'll be at five stars for the rest of your career. Um, and so typically I tell people to just let it go. You know, if you want to, you can put it in another repo somewhere, throw it in an Excel spreadsheet, access database, or you know, throw it in your reporting tools, Power BI, whatever you're gonna throw it in. Um, but moving forward, start with a fresh slate because it not only are your processes likely changing, but there might be a huge benefit in just letting go of the past. <laughs> it sounds like a therapy session. <laughs> Indeed. We we had, uh, speaking of like community and tools and how community can help you choose and optimize tools, we had a community session totally driven by the community. The the vendor themselves was not even involved. Uh, just customers of the vendor coming together to see how you can best optimize like data structures within, within the tool. Super cool experience because it was completely customer driven. Mm -hmm. At the same time, uh, like I started a project and the reason why I kind of wanted to have the workshop was because I was trying to solve a problem within my project because I thought we were overcomplicating it. Uh, and when we're overcomplicating it, it gets deeper and deeper of like, okay, I'm stuck in this, I'm stuck in that. Um, and it goes to showing like, if you really simplify it, and if you keep it a lot easier and more broad strokes, maybe you don't need to keep all that historical data. One of the things that I really learned in that community workshop was, do you actually need to be measuring that deep? or like what's the actual full outcome that you want of it? And I think starting at that outcome and working backwards from that is an important part of choosing tooling because then you're saying, okay, this is really the problem that we wanna solve. Now let's actually see what can solve that in the most efficient way possible and you know the best quality way possible for what we need. I think right. when you talk about quality and the capabilities of tools, there, are sometimes, and some people that I've helped with have a lot of tools that are doing very similar things and they need to scale back because, hey, we have 100% of quality, but maybe the business needs to reduce cost and needs to start really looking at you know profitability and maybe there's some difficult decisions you need to make around tooling. What would you say is that like 100%, 80% rule? Because the advice that I generally give is, you know, you have 100% of tools now that's giving you 100% capability. If you really need to scale back, what can you cut out and scale back to maybe 80% of what you need it to do to continue and really meet that cost need? What would you say is the advice you'd give for that scaling back? Wow, that's a good one. I, I don't think anyone's ever asked me that before. I, I think like the first thing that comes to mind um, is to reach out to your vendors uh, if they are true if they are true partners they're going to help you find ways of ways to reduce your cost uh maybe there's discounts they can apply uh, and uh, we give discounts to customers that want to provide use cases or, or case studies so we'll we'll throw some marketing resources at them so that we can tell their story and share it with others. And that's a huge benefit for us because then we have these real stories that we can tell. Um, and a lot of times we're working with them to pull really specific metrics that other people want to know. Things like, um, you know, tickets per hour, cost per ticket, um, average time between incidents, all, all these metrics that people are just addicted to. And so a lot of times a vendor that's a true partner will will work with you to, to, to lower your costs, to lower the operating costs. And then I think the, the second bit I would say is to 
do portfolio management. If you haven't, if you haven't looked into portfolio management, there are some really good principles in there that will help you uh, with your application rationalization to understand the stakeholders, the return on investment, and it seems like a ton of work to go through your stack and like you know build an express Excel spreadsheet. These are all the applications that we use. Here's how much they cost and then do an ROI analysis on those those actual tools. It's not an easy task. And if anyone listening who's been through app rationalization, uh, they know that it can be a witch hunt. It can be full of fear and uncertainty and doubt. And it's political because you can't ever really escape politics. But that really is what an application rationalization um, activity is meant to do. Try to remove those politics, try to remove that bias, give us some statistics on real ROI for these applications and, and tool sets, and then hopefully you're able to come together as a team to make those decisions because then, you know, uh, you can align on the goals and move forward so you can get back to 100% eventually. Yeah, great question, though, Neil. That's a tough one. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it, especially since you talk about like making this really the full exercise. At what has there ever been an experience for you where you kind of almost throw that out the door because the culture of the company or the vendor doesn't match with your values and what you're looking to achieve, culture-wise? A thousand percent. Yes, I think that's. It's one of the best reasons to make uh, a change, to make a system change. Our cultures don't match. What you're trying to accomplish is not what we're trying to accomplish. And, and I saw this in a few altruistic organizations that I got to be a part of where, you know, they, they say no to clients. We aren't a good fit or, or um, I'm not going to be able to save you enough money on operations to justify the cost of, of spending on our software. And that's a really tough thing to do, especially when you're trying to make sales. But uh, that's the reality of the matter that every tool that you purchase, the vendor should be earning you back more than you've invested in it. So something like Excel costs $50 a month, it better save us $100 a month. Uh, or $150 a month or more than that. And so I think that's kind of where proper investing uh, principles come into play, you know, and, and hopefully uh, really good vendors have calculators and ways to really quickly understand if you're a right fit, they, they call it product market fit. And, um, the, the best vendors know when they're not a good fit and they, they walk away from deals. It's, it's a uh, it's it's not common but it is very awesome when it happens you, you start to see who's really all who can be altruistic who can because that's kind of what you're doing when you're picking a vendor or picking a software supplier especially for these big systems is you're picking a culture it's a it's a it's not a personal relationship, but man, does it ever feel like it? Because your companies need to be tied together because your success should breed their success and their success should breed your success. And if it's not that way, it's not a very good partnership. They're just a parasite trying to make money off of you. No, I always think it's important not to tie yourself to a tool per se and like dig that hole a little bit deeper in case you do need to have that flexibility as well. I love that you're talking about it being a relationship because vendor relationships and vendor management is also very important when you're kind of having these conversations and you're talking about uh, how, you know, if we need to scale back or reduce tooling, talk to your CSM, see how they can help you. How do you go about having those conversations with your vendors? Yeah, I think the, the vendors want to have them. Oftentimes, uh, being on the dark side of things, we think we don't want to bother our customers. You know, why would I do outreach? I'm not going to interrupt so-and-so on their day. But if, if it's coming from the customer, hopefully you've picked a good vendor where they want to pick up the phone. They're actually excited to talk to you. Um, and just like a, re a relationship, you know, if if you they they might be feeling a type of way 
neglected or you know forgotten and so picking up that phone and starting to build that bridge you know it works so well in relationships it works well in vendor vendor relationships too so if you don't feel like you're very connected to your vendors there might be a reason for that maybe you need to switch uh, account reps and you can totally request that stuff because you know vendors we've got performance metrics to hit too so hopefully yeah hopefully you can just pick up the phone and actually start interacting with people and if you can't then um you know it might be time to look at other ways of of working other vendors uh or reaching out to other people in the company to see you know is there a different way i'm supposed to be engaging with you what do you expect as a vendor um the really good ones will set those expectations early and, and and pick up the phone and love that you're reaching out to them because they ultimately want to save the sale too you know they don't want their arr or or monthly revenue to go down any more than you want to switch vendors necessarily so i think uh, hopefully they they see the the value in you reaching out giving them a warning sign like hey the sun's not working here. The relationship <laughs> isn't great. I'm not feeling good <laughs> when I log in or whatever it is. You uh, know. The entire time you're talking about this, what's going through my head is like, you got to have the golden rule of vendor management, which is mm. manage vendors the way you want to be managed. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. That's a good one. I mean, as a vendor, like being on the other side of that vendor management relationship, because we're a vendor for organizations as well, it's like, yeah, yes. how can you go through that relationship and build it as well? Yeah, yeah, you know, you know, you want to keep those customers just as much as they don't want to have to switch or find a new one. And, and a lot of them don't have the freedom, even, you know, especially on like government contracts or things that have to go to RFP uh, requests for proposals, then, you know, in that in those cases, it can be a rock and a hard place. So it really is about picking your vendors well, you know it's it's the same you know when you're in a relationship you can date around all you want but if you don't pick a good one that's gonna last then you know you gotta go back to the dating game eventually <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to put it we, we covered a lot of things already uh, throughout the conversation as well you know how do you go about picking the right vendors for your needs. I think doing the customer research, who are you serving? What is the actual outcome that the tool is supposed to give you? And what's the ROI that you're gonna save from it? And then optimizing that tool of how long is it gonna last you and how can you make it you know, as successful for as long as possible while keeping those costs and efficiency and like the process management you know, quite low. And then building that relationship with your vendors in terms of like, really being able to contact them reach out to them and build that cultural relationship with them as well because it is mutual success at the end of the day uh, and i think those are all amazing things to think about as you're choosing the tools that you want to have how can you create the best customer experience and the best rep experience for the most efficient cost and i say efficient purposely because you don't want to sacrifice quality for uh just just cost reduction right um I think those are all amazing things. I have one last question uh, to kind of wrap up the conversation. Over the course of your long-term service experience and service management in your career, what's one thing that you've learned across the you know time that has stuck with you that you really still hold to today as well? I think for me, th there's three things that I always try to stick to diversify always be looking for new ideas always be looking for new places to learn and then the second one would be deviation always question what you know because things change you change customers change and then the last one and most important is discipline having the discipline to not get distracted by the shiny things having the discipline to do the hard work the work that isn't sexy per se you know that those are the three principles that i find apply universally and really fit what i need to remember when it comes to being a great team member and a great contributor to a to a goal 
No, I think that's that's really amazing. I mean, especially if you think about you know, what does that long term look like? If you diversify, you have a lot of options and you can continue to put the work in to have those options available to you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you joining the conversation and coming and sharing your knowledge and, and helping others to grow and hopefully choose the best tools and be able to build those relationships with their vendors uh, as well. Thank, thank you so much. Pleasure is mine. Thank you for having me, Neil.